Today we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Dr. Daryl. Uh, this morning in the first service, I was going to say you're in for a treat, but then I wasn't sure because I hadn't heard it. But now I have, so I can say you're in for a treat. Uh, God has uniquely gifted this man with a wonderful intellect, uh, an amazing sense of humor, and he ties them together in a way that actually makes sense and that he's able to teach the truth of the Bible in a way that will impact our lives. Would you welcome Dr. Daryl, please? Thank you, Keith, again. Good morning. A few years ago, I had the chance to uh, listen to an interview of uh, Dallas Willard uh, by John Ortberg. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know Dallas Willard, one of my heroes, one of the modern-day fathers of the faith. For 47 years, he was a professor of philosophy at USC, University of Southern California. That's not a secular university. And, 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 and he passed away about four years ago. But just in this interview, Ortberg asked him a very interesting question about the rhythm. I mean, he enters into an antagonistic situation every day on that campus. And I mean, philosophy, are you kidding me? And yet, the way he prepared every morning for that day, and sometimes a rough day, what it would be the question, what do you do for personal devotions? Now, now, you don't hear that phrase very much, but it really is, how do you get in rhythm for the morning? How do you get in rhythm for the day? How do you get focused? And it was interesting because what he said so has defined what I do for the last few years every morning, every morning. Because what he said he would do is he'd recite out loud a particular psalm. Always the same psalm. And, and the reason he would do it out loud is because of a very peculiar verse that Romans 8.16, Paul writes, that he said, don't you know it's the, there's a spirit of God that bears witness with your spirit, you're a child of God. Now, when you read the Bible, do you ever ask questions? Like, huh? Like, 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 what, what? The Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. Somehow the Holy Spirit reminds me of who I am, a child of God. I want to know, Paul, how does he do that? Okay, is the Holy Spirit and my spirit have little chit-chats down here and feels like a little bit of gas or something going on? Or No, 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 no. My, my spirit is my consciousness. Somehow the Holy Spirit speaks to my spirit in such a way that I recognize it, and it reminds me of the same thing again and again. Daryl, you're a child of God. Well, well, when does that, how does that happen? Well, it's the quiet voice of the Spirit. Well, that could be a bad pizza for all I know. Where do I know for sure I have the words, the vocabulary given to the Holy Spirit? Where do you find the vocabulary given to the Spirit of God within you? It's the very words He gave us through the Scriptures. And so by reciting, Dallas Willard said by reciting out loud, the, basically the words, vocabulary of the Spirit of God, speaking to his spirit, reminding him again and again of the same thing. And reminding him that he was a child of God and God's presence always with him. He was ready with the rhythm of every morning. And the psalm was the 23rd psalm. So if you love God, you have your Bibles. So open your Bibles to this 23rd Psalm because I want to give you a gift this morning. I want to walk you through this. You see, Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now, I like the idea that when I'm crushed in spirit and my heart's broken, that the Lord's presence is with me. But you want to know something? My heart's not crushed all the time. And my spirit's not always broken all the time. So what about all the other times? Is the spirit of God somehow is his presence with me? Well, this is what the 23rd Psalm is all about. It's to remind us we're children of God and God is so engaged that he's engaged with every moment of your life. And we've got to be reminded of this because we get so distracted. So you'll notice here as you turn to Psalm 23, this is by David. A psalm, a hymn, by David, who's a shepherd himself. And he writes this Hebrew song describing God's care. Like it or not, we all need a shepherd. In other words, we all need to know that somebody is paying attention to me. Someone's got my back. Someone's engaged with the details of my life. We all need a shepherd. And the key to this whole thing is right slap in the middle of the song. 
It's like we're going to ascend one half and we're going to get to the top of the mountain and find it. And once we find it, then we will descend the backside of the mountain. And it all begins with reminding us of our contentment. Notice we ascend the peak and it begins with the Lord is my shepherd. I, I, I lack nothing. In other words, we do not need to be considered needy, needy, needy people. Have you ever met people that way? I need, I need, I need. Everything's all about what they need, they need, need. He says, and it's, I love the Hebrew text. Remember when David wrote this song, he wrote it in Hebrew. And this has only four words. It is basically Yahweh, shepherd, no lack. No lack. See, he doesn't refer to himself as a rancher because a rancher raids cattle for slaughter. And this isn't about a leg of lamb, all right? Isn't great that the Lord is my rancher who's preparing me for slaughter. That's not the psalm. This is about a shepherd in relationship to sheep that primarily provided wool for warmth. It was a shepherd who gives. And he gives to those who will indeed give to others and bring warmth to others as well. But he says, therefore, I, 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 I shall not want. I'm not a needy, needy person. Jesus in John 10, he, he said, hey, I am the good shepherd. And that's when he made this promise. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So I don't have to look any further that Jesus very much is my shepherd engaged in the details. His presence is always with me. Just like he said in Matthew 28, Lo, I'm with you always to the end of the, to the, end of the age. You know, do you like people ripping you out of context? I mean, someone kind of says, you know, I, I brought her into my arms and I gave her a big hug and we were so close and the warmth was there and all of a sudden you realize it's the context of my mother and me. That changes the whole point. <laughs> context is pretty important. It also gets really weird. Well, that, that, that Philippians 4.13 that we read again and again and memorize, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But we never think, what is the context? And the context is you don't have to be, we are not needy, needy people. Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. If I have a lot, I have a little. I can do all things through Christ because I know he has, his presence is with me. I don't have to want. I don't have to be needy, needy, needy. Have you ever thrown a pity party? <laughs> I throw them all the time. You notice no one ever comes. I mean, really, I, I would love to invite you this afternoon to my pity party. I'll serve free. It doesn't happen. And, and so we don't throw pity parties. So it begins by reminding we have a shepherd. And he gives. He's engaged. And therefore, I don't want. I don't have to be needing everything because he gives me primarily what I need. And here's how he does it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, now sheep are primarily French. I mean, they're bullheaded. You cannot get a sheep to lie down in any pasture. Try it. Push that baby down. Kick it. You, you just can't get that baby down. Because sheep will not lie down until they are freed from fear. Now, when they are relaxed and they're no longer afraid, they're on the ground. And here he says, uh, the shepherds, he makes me lie down in green pasture. Somehow, he removes the fear out of my life. When I begin each reminding myself each morning, you know, Daryl, you don't have to be afraid today. You know what the experience of the absence of fear? You know, most people you do know are driven by fear. Everything they do all the, throughout the day, they're trying to get out of trouble, not make trouble, not get, not get in trouble. And everybody's motivated by fear, fear, fear. Do you know what it feels like not to be fearful? The Greeks actually had a word for it, kara. It means joy. Translated joy. Joy is the absence of fear, embracing the future, not being afraid. And so he says, he makes me lie down by reminding me, Daryl, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. And then he leads me beside quiet waters. You know, sheep will not drink if they're distracted. Therefore, sheep will not drink from a running stream. Did you know that? Because they're all distracted by what the stream's going, where it's doing, what's in the stream. Only, only when you would take a sheep to one of those small canyons where the wadis would basically, brook would run its course into a little pool of still water because there would be no distractions. And in those moments of no distractions, then they could drink. 
You know, notice that we don't find this ourselves. He leads us to quiet waters. He leads us to times that we cannot be so distracted with everything, but to reflect. You know, the emotions that God has given us all have a design. For example, the emotion of affection uh, motivates you to serve somebody, to care for them. Uh, The emotion of fear the old fight or flight thing. If you're fearful, you run or you fight. Uh, the emotion of anger moves you to correct something you think is wrong. So it is with the emotion of grief and sorrow. We get in our culture that to feel sad, you got to medicate that because you shouldn't feel sad because that's not normal. Oh, isn't it? What if God has designed sadness, sorrow, for the purpose to move us to reflection, to think? Take some time and just quietly drink from the quiet waters, no distractions, and think about, what am I doing? Because at this time, he says, he refreshes my soul. My soul. The Hebrew word is nefesh. It, 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 it's it what makes you unique from, from anyone else. He, he says, he restores my, my, my soul. Because the world keeps trying to define who I am, and not letting God define me because of my soul. We, I tell, I've learned one thing. This year, Holly and I turned 68, and aging sucks. It really is. I'll, I'll never forget waking up morning some years ago, looking at my hands, and going, where are they? These are my father's hands. These are not my hands. And then when I looked at my arms, oh my God, what, what happened? And then you look in the mirror and you go, what in the world? See, when we're young, it's like we're sealed in a car, but a brand new car. And when at your age you look in that mirror, you're not always going to look that good, guys. Because you got this young car, young body, and everything works. But after a while, this car gets beat up, and we're sealed in, and we can't get out. And that's why in our soul, we still feel young, but then we kind of go, what's going on? on here because the world wants to define us by what we look like in a mirror. But you remember when you learned fractions in fifth, sixth grade? I'm sorry, homeschool. First, second grade? (laughs) I wish they would have led with the larger the bottom number, the smaller the top number. Because my top number is 68. You're supposed to be dead at 68. That seems all, but not when you look at what the bottom number, soul, eternal soul. Oh my, I'm only 68 years and an eternal soul. No wonder I feel a bit young. No wonder when I look out these eyes and I go, what, what is going on? And I stopped this day letting the world define who I am, what I am. He restores my nephesh, my soul. When I have time to reflect, And remember, in the cool water, he causes me to refresh my soul, my nephesh. I realize I'm a a child of God. And my soul now is motivated to honor him, for he's my father. Then he guides me along the paths, the right paths, for his name's sake. If you ever go to Palestine and you go to Judean desert, you're going to see all these hills. And they look like somebody came along with a, a, a huge comb and combed all the hills. And you go, what what is that? That's the sheep pathways. For hundreds and hundreds of years, shepherds know they can't take the sheep straight up to the top of the hill because it's too steep. So they take them around and around and around and around until they get to the top. And these rings are the pathways of the sheep. Now those sheep, they don't know where they're headed. But they trust the shepherd that wherever it happens, that shepherd works all things together for good to those who love the sheep and are loved by the, Lord, the shepherd. And so he just takes them the next pathway, the next step. He noticed it's for his name's sake. He's the one I'm going to trust. I'm just going to do what's in front of me. I'm not going to worry about my 80s yet. I talked to somebody in their 80s and they said, boy, your 70s are going to go faster than your 60s. That is a bit petrifying. Kind of like the, you notice the toilet paper roll, it just kind of starts real slow. At the very end, blah, 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 blah. that's kind of what's starting to feel like now. But the fact is, all I really know for today is I have this moment. I'm not going to live in the future. I can plan for it. I, I'm not going to live in the past. I can learn from it. 
but I have right now, I have a window right now to extract life. And for his name's sake, he gives me the path. He guides me. If I honor what he tells me to do every day, I'm not going to worry about what top of the mountain and what the top of the mountain is going to be like. He's got it. He's got it. Well, that contentment moves me right to courage. He says, though, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no, no, no evil. Again, in the Judean desert, if you come up from Egypt, you stop off in Jericho for a Coke or whatever, and, and basically then you continue north to Jerusalem. Now this route, this route from Jericho up to Jerusalem is very interesting because it's really dangerous because robbers and thieves hide out in those hills away from the strong arm of Rome back in the days of Jesus. As a matter of fact, this was the backdrop to Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. We talked about the thieves coming upon the Good Samaritan. Even in the days of David, uh, uh, this pathway was called the Valley of the Shadow, take a guess, of death. It's not that people died there. It was just dark valleys, dangerous. And the fact is, is that he says, even though I walk through the valley of dangerous world, I mean, come on, this is a world, a broken world with Broken people who are trying to break people. So it's not like you got your eyes closed. This isn't about a fantasy. This is, yeah, we live in the, a valley that is dangerous, but he says, I fear not the evil. I don't deny that there's evil. I know there's evil around, but I don't fear it. Interesting, Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, he talks about this virtue of, of, of courage. Uh, uh, courage in the sense that God gives you an ability to set aside fear as long as you identify what the fear is. He doesn't work in nebulous terms. So in other words, I've got to, maybe one of these times I'm drinking the cool water by myself and thinking and sadness, I need to make a little list. What do I really fear? Do I fear death? Do I fear the suffering of death? I don't fear death, but bring a lot of morphine along with you. I mean, there are some things that we fear. And I fear rejection. Do I, I fear losing my job? Do I fear being a failure? Sometimes we've got to articulate what is it we fear? Because only when we know what we fear as we go into the valley of the shadow of death can God help us set that thing to a side. Fear doesn't go away, but it doesn't stop you. It doesn't stop you. Did, did, did you see that movie Hacksaw Ridge? Boy, World War II. Okinawa, got to take this island. The Japanese are dug in the tunnels. There is a 400-foot cliff, Hacksaw Ridge, that the World War II soldiers got to go up, climb a rope up that ridge and then fight the Japanese, and they would be slaughtered and slaughtered and slaughtered. Well, there's this one young kid named Desmond, Desmond Dawson. And Desmond's a Seventh-day Adventist. He, he's a Christian. And he just does not want to kill. He does not want to carry a gun. He has the spit beaten out of him in, in boot camp. Because they all think he's a coward. He just wants to be a medic. Finally, he gets over there, and he's going to go up with him without a gun to protect himself. And the other medic said, you better lose that helmet. They like blowing the heads off of anything with a red cross on it. So he goes up, if you remember. After groups, been, groups have been slaughtered and slaughtered. Well, he goes up there, and they're slaughtered. Well, they all retreat and they're off the cliff. They're back down. He stays up there because every morning the Japanese would come out of their caves, out of their tunnels with bayonets and any American breathing would have a bayonet right in his heart. And so Dawson stays up there and he is the first to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor as a conscientious objector. Why? Because 75 times he would take somebody. He'd go on all these dead bodies and find somebody breathing. Maybe a leg's blown off. Maybe the heart. He would take them. They're breathing. He would take them to the edge and with his bleeding hands, he would put them down on a rope. And then he would just pray, Lord, give me one more. Give me one more. But here's the real kicker. When he would reach and find some soldier alive, I say, you're sitting there, you're bleeding. You know the next morning they're gonna come and shoot you and kill you and all of a sudden some kid grabs you and says, I got you. I got you. Talk about salvation. Talk about a feeling of deliverance in that moment. Well, this is what this is all about. So I walk through the valley shallow of death. 
I got you. I got you. How do you know he's got me? Because we've just reached the peak of the mountain. We are slapped right in the middle of the psalm. And notice what he says here. You are with me. Again, I love the Hebrew original because it's just three words. You with me. And you want to know the best way to translate that? I got you. I got you. The fact is God's presence is always with us. Psalm 139, he says, Psalmist says, no matter how far you go, how fast you can run, you cannot remove yourself from the presence of God. See, is that because God is everywhere and, and right now God is this and we're swimming through God? No, no, the verses that talk about God's on the presence can also refer to God as in one location, on his throne, but everything is in his presence. And that includes you. That includes every one of us. Have you ever wondered why the Holy Spirit? Now, as a theologian, I ask weird questions like this. I mean, I, 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 I got the Trinity, uh, the, God the Father, and then there's got to be love within the Trinity to produce love, so the relationship between Father and Son. Okay, got it, got it, Father, Son. But what's with the Holy Spirit thing? Well, where does the Holy Spirit reside? And each and every one of us. I don't understand that. But in John 14, Jesus says, I will send you another comforter and he will be both with you and in you. And in him, you will have my presence and the Father's presence always with you in him. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that you are always in the Father's presence. You are always in the Son's presence because they too in a mysterious way are in the presence with the Spirit of God in you. I got you. So he says, you're with me. Now let's descend the peak. Now that we know he's got us. He says, your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. We'll move quickly. I have nine minutes here. Rod. Now what was the rod? This was a weapon that a young shepherd would take. He'd take a sapling, a young tree, pull it out of the ground. And where the roots basically came from kind of enlarged part of the, uh, 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 of the trunk, that was basically became the hardest part of the wood. They would trim the, the uh, uh, roots off and then they would cut the handle, foot, two feet. That would be the handle, this would be the rod. And those young shepherds, because they didn't have TV or Wi-Fi, they just practiced. And they got really accurate and really fast with these. These were weapons. And here's the point. My shepherd actually has weapons to protect me. He's got me, he's got me because he's got weapons. Weapons I don't even understand. But he's got them. And then when he talks about the staff, I rod and my staff, they comfort me. The staff is interesting. You know what that is, long, slender stick with a little crook in it. It's not identified with anything other than a shepherd. You don't have it with cattle. You don't have it with horses. You don't say, hey, this is my hog staff. No. And for the sheep, they were basically always for one function to guide the sheep, to remind the sheep of the presence of the shepherd. And then when the sheep was kind of getting offline, off on those little pathways about to tumble down the side of the hill, just to kind of keep the sheep on the pathway, it was protection and guidance. And then he says, listen, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The the shepherd made it possible for the sheep to graze even with the threats of wild animals that wanted to have the sheep for a meal. Again, there are people out there who want to hurt you. There's people out there who want to hurt me. This isn't fantasy. And so, yeah, we live in the valley shadow of death, but he prepares a table that we can actually live our lives. We can dine. We can eat. We can be together and enjoy even though we live in a world that's dangerous. But what if we get roughed up? You will get roughed up. But notice what he says. And when I get roughed up by this world, he anoints my what? He anoints my head with oil. You see, yeah, I may get hurt. And I do get hurt. I, I cry. I get discouraged. We all do. But never where God cannot heal me. I come back from all of it. Because the Spirit of God anoints my head with oil. He can heal any cut this world is going to go ahead and put upon me. And therefore, my cup overflows. What is this overflowing cup? Remember, I, I pretend you remember things I said two, three years ago. Uh, but let me continue in my fantasy. But remember the word shalot in the Ecclesiastes 5, Solomon's personal journal. Remember we said you remember that by saying, God, thanks shalot. 
Remember, the word means to empower. Shalat is that if I acknowledge whatever I have has been given to me by hand of God, he shalats me. He empowers me to extract enjoyment from it. And so therefore, if I acknowledge that my spouse, my children, my, my friends, my, my new lime green Jeep out in the parking lot, all given to me by the hand of God, he shalats me. If someone gives you a gift of a sizzling steak, that's a great gift, but you better have your teeth. Or all of a sudden, that gift becomes a curse. So it's not only the gift, but it's the capacity to extract enjoyment from the gift. And therefore, he says, my cup overflows. Because I acknowledge everything I have, everything brought into my life, comes from the hand of God. Or, whatever I don't have. I don't have it because it wasn't given to me by the hand of God. He even shalots me for that. I don't know how many times we live in a beautiful place, don't we, in Paradise Valley and Scottsdale, and there's some beautiful, huge homes. And, 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 and in July, when I'm driving around, I kind of think, because we live in a nice little townhouse, 2,000 square foot townhouse, and I look at these big, beautiful castles, and I think, I wonder how much they're paying APS for utilities this month. <laughs> I mean, God actually empowers you to enjoy what you don't have because my cup overflows. Well, that moves from the contentment to reminding not only am I content, not only am I courageous, but, but confidence. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. The word, word good is the Hebrew word tov. Remember when God created the heavens and the earth after everything he made, he said, this is good, this is good, the word tov, it means it's designed to be enjoyed, designed to be a blessing. God will, every day of my life, will be bringing things into my life designed for me to enjoy, to extract enjoyment. He says, and indeed mercy. Mercy will follow me all the days of my life. This is an interesting word. It's the Hebrew word chesed. Sometimes translated mercy, loving kindness, love. Uh, the word actually speaks of caring about the well-being for another person. The fact that my shepherd, that God, he cares about my well-being. And he's going to make sure this day, at this time, he stays engaged with me always. And what's, what happens if something happens to me? Well, you know, in Psalm 103, as I understand that uh, you have had a wonderful sermon on Remember the part he just says, God says, remember, I'm like a compassionate father. I realize you're bony. I realize you are but dust. Remember when I taught that junior high kids on the junior high pastor? All of a sudden the kids started laughing. Seventh graders, aren't they great? Hey, the Bible says we're but dust. <laughs> no, there's a comma there. <laughs> we're but dust. <laughs> but the idea there is the fact is that I... God cares about my well-being no matter. It's not about me. It's about who he is, a compassionate father. He's my shepherd. Well, then last of all, he says, and you fear about death? Huh. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever? I mean, God's presence is with us to the last breath. John 14, the first three verses, the boys, the disciples were all bummed out because they thought he was going to live forever and be a king and Set him up as top dogs in that kingdom. Now he's talking about dying. Going to be arrested later on that night, crucified the next day. And he says this. He begins the John 14. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you'll be also forever with the Lord. For indeed, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, the new atheists like Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawkins and the late Carl Sagan, they tell us, quote, we are all alone in this universe. It does not have any of us in mind. It is cold, impersonal. We exist as an accident on a small speck of a planet without any purpose, destiny, or hope. Boy, it really makes me want to be an atheist. <laughs> well, maybe the universe is cold and impersonal. 
Maybe the universe doesn't have me in mind, but its creator does. See, that's why every morning when he was alive, Dallas Willard would begin speaking out loud, giving vocabulary to the Holy Spirit, to speak to his spirit, to remind him he's a child of God, and talk about getting in tune with the rhythm of the day. Can you think of a better way to start the day to get in your car and as you're driving out loud, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to those still waters and restores my soul. He, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear the evil. For he's got me. For you are with me. He, he, he presents before me a table in the presence of my enemies. And he anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness. And his mercy and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. All day today. And... I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can you think of a better way to start the day than letting the Spirit of God with a vocabulary given to him by himself to speak to your spirit, to remind your spirit, your soul of what he's got planned for you today. It makes every day an adventure. Every day an adventure with such contentment, with such courage, such confidence, what more you need for rhythm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of this gift, Lord. I, I would pray that each and every one of us, let's memorize this thing. It's not that long. And yet, Father, I would pray that you would cause us to commit this to heart, that we might, as Dallas Willard did, as you've taught me over these years, as our personal devotions, that we would be reciting out loud, speaking out loud, meditating out loud on these words. Now we understand how rich they are. So that we could get in rhythm for the day, get ready for the day, be reminded about the day and who we really are and what you're going to accomplish. Father, make our days, every days, days that honor you, with great adventure. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.